Welcome to The Truth About Pet Cancer. I'm your host, Ty Bollinger. Thank you for signing up to watch this free seven-part docuseries. Over the past couple of years, I've traveled across North America, interviewing some of the brightest veterinarians and scientists in an effort to learn the most effective treatments and preventions for pet cancer. I'm excited to share this enlightening journey with you so that you can learn this life-saving information that will help you enjoy a happier and healthier life with your pet. A recent Harvard University study indicated that merely owning a dog can make you healthier and happier. They even put out a Harvard special report entitled, Get Healthy, Get a Dog. 60% of U.S. households own a dog and 47% own a cat, according to a 2017-2018 National Pet Owners Survey conducted by the American Pet Products Association. My family is definitely a part of the 60% and the 47%. We have a German Shepherd named Grizzly, about a dozen cats, most of them I can't even remember their names, a thoroughbred horse named Black Thunder, a Shetland pony named Fluffy, and a mini horse named Beauty. So you might be asking, why would I be doing a documentary on pet cancer? Well, it's, it's a very personal story for me. 22 years ago, my father, Graham Bollinger, was diagnosed with cancer. And he was dead within 25 days of diagnosis. He was only 52 years old at that time. I'm 50 as I stand before you today, so just a couple years older than me. He was taken from us way too early. Over the course of the next seven years after I lost my father, both grandfathers, my grandmom, an uncle, a cousin, and finally my mother, they all died from cancer. This was extremely difficult for my wife Charlene and I to deal with. It literally devastated our family for a long time. It seemed like the only thing that we thought about was somebody that had recently died from cancer. We began to do research on cancer because we didn't understand why our family members couldn't be saved. And the things that we learned began to shock us. We began to learn that there are treatments for cancer that work relatively well compared to the traditional treatments, but they're not very well known. They're not taught in med medical schools. They're not implemented in medical practices. And we wanted people to know this information. I mean, it was really a burden on, on us. We, were, we didn't want other families to be devastated the way that we had been devastated by losing so many close family members. So from the very first, with Charlene and I, it was a mission to help educate people about the truth. We published our first book in 2006 and began to learn more as we went along. And it wasn't until 2014 that we hooked up with our current partner in The Truth About Cancer, Jonathan Hunsaker, and we formed The Truth About Cancer and began to produce documentaries to get this word out even more because what we had done in the past was minuscule compared to our audience now. And this was just an effort to continue this mission to save lives, to educate, so that people don't have to lose loved ones to, to cancer because of lack of knowledge. And so it was only natural after producing several documentaries over the last few years on people cancer, that people began to ask us, what can I do to help protect my pets? How can I save my pet? I just lost a pet to cancer. I wish I had known what I could do. And this was kind of a natural evolution for us to go from researching people cancer to pet cancer. And with the people cancer, we, we interviewed the experts, the, the top experts all over the world. In this pet cancer documentary, we've interviewed the, the top veterinarians across the United States and even the world to find the answers to pet cancer. And so that is why we're doing this. It's because we love you. It's because we want you to be healthy. We want your pets to be healthy. And we don't want any more people or pets to die because of a lack of knowledge. So over the course of the next seven days, you're gonna glean some amazing, life-changing information from over 30 experts, including veterinarians, immunologists, medical doctors, scientists, and some proud pet parents. In episode one, which you're about to see, we're gonna uncover the true epidemic that is pet cancer, including some shocking statistics. 
We'll explore the current medical toolkit for treating pet cancer, and you'll learn about the war on cancer, the history of chemotherapy, and we'll attempt to determine how much veterinary research is truly independent. In episode number two, we'll explore the pet food industry in great detail, and you'll learn some dirty little secrets from insiders, including how pet food is actually made, processed, and produced, and exactly where the ingredients come from. Together, we will examine the science of epigenetics and nutrigenomics, we'll scrutinize species-appropriate diets, the ketogenic diet, and we'll dive into the facts about kibble. Episode three is 100% devoted to uncovering the truth about pet vaccines. We're gonna put vaccines under a microscope so that you can learn which ones are necessary, which ones are not, which ones are safe, which ones are dangerous. How often should you vaccinate? You might be shocked when you hear Dr. John Robb as he explains why they started vaccinating cats in the leg rather than the scruff. In episode four, we'll examine environmental toxins, chemicals, pesticides, and an herbicide called glyphosate, determining just how much harm they are causing in our pets. What about these flea and tick collars? Or that heartworm medication? What about those cleaning products you're using in your home? And what about GMOs, genetically modified organisms, in the food supply? Are these things actually silent triggers that are causing pet cancer rates to skyrocket? Find out in episode four. In episode five, you will learn some practical and easy to follow steps on how to turn a C minus pet diet into a B plus pet diet with very little additional cost. We'll examine the potentially damaging effects of stress on your pet and you'll learn the actual science behind the phrase that laughter is the best medicine. And it'll be music to your ears when you hear a Grammy award winning artist describe the musical frequencies specifically used to heal pets. Do you have a smart meter in your home? Then you'll definitely want to tune in to episode number five. In episode six, you'll hear from experts using cannabis to treat pet cancer, sharing the stories of their own pets and their patients. You'll also learn specific methods to incorporate essential oils into your pet's daily health regimen and even his or her oral health. We'll examine the science of homeopathy and homotoxicology and we'll learn why much of natural medicine is currently not included in the educational curriculum at both medical schools and veterinary schools. In episode seven, we learn some secrets from Asia and discover the ins and outs of Eastern medicine. And you'll be able to learn from a veterinarian who had the first department of acupuncture outside of China, right here in the USA. We'll learn which roots, exotic plants, and herbs from the Amazon are the most potent at fighting cancer. You'll get an up-close look at innovative surgical procedures which are helping pets stay cancer-free, and we'll hear some encouraging words from pet owners about their survivors and thrivers. Without a doubt, over the next seven days, you're going to learn some incredible and groundbreaking information that will change the way you think about pet cancer. So get your pen and paper ready, buckle your seatbelt, because we're about to embark on a journey that might even save the life of your pet or maybe even a family member. When it comes to cancer, the amount of online information about cancer in dogs and cats is overwhelming. How do you know what advice to trust? An estimated 6 million dogs and nearly 6 million cats will be diagnosed with cancer this year. But according to a 2008 Springer study published on PubMed, only 5 to 10 percent of all cancer cases can be attributed to genetic defects, whereas the remaining 90 to 95 percent have their roots in the environment and lifestyle. The environment lifestyle component contains things like stress, sedentary lifestyle, toxins, pollution, infections, obesity, and of course diet. And pet cancer rates are definitely on the rise. You look back 50 years ago where some will say that the cancer rate may have been one in 100 dogs. Today, according to PhDs, the dog has the highest rate of cancer of any mammal on the planet. Literally from last year, them saying one in two to this year, one in 1.65 dogs will succumb to cancer. One and one in, in three, 1. yeah, 6, and one in three cats. Skeptics will say, oh, we're diagnosing it better or we're diagnosing it earlier. And that just is not reality, okay? We just never used to see it like that. And you'd see it keep on skyrocketing. Year after year, you would see more where it's now the largest uh, cause of death in animals. I ran across a study and the study said that your dog is four times more likely to get breast cancer than you are, 
eight times more likely to get bone cancer than you are, and up to 35 times more likely to get skin cancer than you are. When I graduated Cornell in 1973, approximately one out of 10 dogs got cancer, and it was always a disease of the old. So if we saw a dog that had a lump and the dog was young, we eliminated cancer as a possibility from what's called the differential diagnosis, just based on age. We do see commonly dogs under 18 months of age with terminal cancer. What used to be a disease of the old is now unfortunately a disease of the young. Why do you think that cancer is so pervasive in pets today? Well, it's not just pets, it's in people as well, especially in children, because the exposures, the environmental exposures that, that the smaller animals and smaller children get would be a much larger impact on their body than it would be in a larger animal or an adult. Now, we know that glyphosate and, moreover, the entire formulation of Roundup, which is what they used, is very toxic and it has all sorts of effects on the body. And uh, it was declared by the World Health Organization as a probable human carcinogen, class 2A. Now, they also determined that it is definitely a carcinogen for animals. So when we're talking about pets, it's not probable, it is a animal carcinogen, according to the World Health Organization's uh, IARC committee, which makes the determination for the world. Why are we seeing just this, this epidemic in pet cancers? Oh my gosh, there's, I think there's a lot of reasons. Um, and I've been in practice for 33 years. So those three decades that you're talking about, I've lived through them. And I think that we've changed how we deal with our pets over the years. So, you know, back in the 50s, we had farm dogs and they ate what was left over from the, what was grown on the farm. And we weren't using such horrible chemicals on the plants and the crops. And we weren't feeding processed food to our animals. They were eating whole, nutritious, real foods. And um, we weren't giving vaccinations every single year. We didn't have most of the vaccinations. And, and I'm not saying that we should never vaccinate because they have saved many lives. However, the over vaccination is rampant. The chemicals that we are now throwing at our pets for parasite prevention are over the top toxic, in my opinion. And I, I think that we need to pull back and really look what we are doing to these animals. Cancer is certainly a big problem in pets today. But before we go any further, let's take a step back for a moment to learn from Boston College professor and biochemist, Dr. Thomas Seafried, as well as Dr. Ian Billingsworth, a world-renowned veterinarian from Australia. Exactly what is cancer? Is it the same in pets as humans? Is it genetic? Currently, we work on the theory that cancer is caused by a series of random mutations to growth controlling genes in the nucleus of the cell. And yet modern science is showing that is incorrect. There is something else going on here and it's related to our mitochondria. All the cancers are the same. And, and, and this is one thing people have a great deal of difficulty realizing. They think breast cancer is different from brain cancer, different from colon, bladder, and maybe different in dogs than humans, uh, mice, and you know, they're all the same. Cancer starts from damage to the respiration, regardless of the tissue, the cell, or the organism, right? So uh, dogs, mice, they have cancer for the same reason that humans have cancer. The mitochondria become damaged. Now, what happens is that once the mitochondria become damaged, they throw out what we call reactive oxygen species, ROS. They are mutagenic and carcinogenic. So the mutations that people study in the genome are an effect of the damage to the respiration, okay? So they are an effect, not the cause, all right? So yet the field is focusing on an effect and not the cause. Hey, what Otto Warburg said was the tumors are using the glucose as a fermentable fuel because their respiration is defective. So he said every cancer cell has some defect in the mitochondria. That causes the cell to fall back on fermentation. And the fuel for fermentation is glucose. So it became clear, right? if I lowered the glucose, and then when you raise ketones, all the normal cells of the body burn the ketone. Once you understand the biology of the adversary, you know how to design a therapy to, to, to match that. If you don't understand the biology, then you're, you're constantly in the dark and you're constantly producing therapies that are only marginally effective 
and toxic. It is a well-known and accepted fact that cancer cells burn sugar as fuel. Now, Dr. Seafree just described modern cancer treatments as marginally effective and toxic. Do you know that most pet cancers will be treated with the same toxic and marginally effective treatments, the big three, as people cancer? That's radiation, chemo, and surgery. That's because these treatments are considered to be the standards of practice. What's called the accepted standard of practice is what you're judged by. And if the accepted standard of practice is to provide chemo or radiation or surgery, if you're not doing that, you're liable as a veterinarian. Okay, so you're the, veter the veterinarian, yes, there may be a financial interest, but also you're caught between a rock and a hard place where they're saying that's accepted standard of practice. So if your dog gets diagnosed with cancer and the doctor says, oh, they have to have chemotherapy, you put the dog on chemotherapy, immediately their health starts to deteriorate because they're being poisoned, right? And the doctor says, look how bad the cancer is getting. You know, this is a fraud. It's actually, it's worse than a stage magician in Vegas, hiding a tiger in the back of a cage and then putting a curtain on, you know, and then boom, there's a, there's a white tiger here all of a sudden, it's magic. This is, this is charlatanism. This is con artistry in medicine that is, that is more deceptive than any kind of stage magic. So, you yeah, know, that, it really that's, what it, that's what these people are doing. They're conning pet owners into chemically poisoning their dogs and cats and calling it medicine, but it isn't. It's animal cruelty. It, it's, it's the worst form of animal cruelty because that dog trusts you. You're their owner, you're their companion, you're their family, and you betray them when you poison them with chemotherapy. It would be much more compassionate to treat them holistically support their quality of life, and even if they do die from cancer one day, at least it's a, it's a more natural death and not a painful, tormented, chemical abuse of that animal. Some of the vets got up in arms because I had some of my students that became veterinarians, and um, some of the drug companies would come in with chemo for dogs, and then you would give the dog a similar structure of what we had for the human, and the dog would get sick as hell, uh, you know, vomiting and diarrhea and all kinds of horrible things. And the, some of the vets said, we can't use this drug on, on our pets because it's animal cruelty. You know, it's, it's animal, but we'll use it in the clinic for the human. <laughs> so it's like, well, the human has all those problems, but people are, 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 are fearful because they know that, well, if you, if you have cancer, you're gonna have to expect a lot of suffering. Um, this is insane. What are you, su you don't need to have this suffering. It's one of my aunts that had lymphoma and died in her, pretty early in her mid 60s. And she said to me, one of her last things that she shared with me, she goes, don't ever do to an animal, it's yourself, what they did to me with chemo, you know? And um, I, always, I took that to heart, you know? Because she didn't have great quality of life. I think the, the, the problem with these treatments is that um, instead of supporting and helping and enhancing the body's own immunity and, and, and defense, uh, we end up poisoning the body, we end up really disrupting and disturbing the metabolism of the body, thinking that we're going to make it healthier. It's like pouring sewage in a lake and thinking that we're going to purify it by puring, pour, pouring sewage in it. So I think that we need to really see cancer treatments as the last ditch resort. Why would the standard of care be treatments that, according to the evidence, do not work very well? They should be used as a last ditch resort and they could even make the cancer worse. Let's have a look at the history of chemotherapy and learn more about the standard of care treatments in an effort to better understand this intriguing and important question. The first chemotherapy agents and even some of the agents that are still used today are derived from the mustard gases that were used to kill soldiers in the world wars. In order for having a maximum chance of fighting and uh, overcoming cancer, uh, we need an intact immune system. And that too uh, makes the current approach of chemotherapy so unethical. It destroys the chemotherapy, the first organ that is affected, actually the target organ uh, is uh, the bone marrow. The destruction of the generation of defense cells, leukocytes, etc., are built in the, uh, in the bone marrow. So from the very onset, from the very planning, uh, of chemotherapy from the very scientific approach, it is 
a deception. It is an unethical, deceptive business that uh, creates illusions for millions of people and everyone, every scientist involved in it. I'm not blaming the doctors. They sometimes uh, don't have the education uh, uh, to, to go at that length. But, but every scientist mm -hmm. knows that mm -hmm. it is a huge fraud. And those who say they don't, they should quit the job of being a scientist. The sad thing about chemotherapy is that it does enhance the malignancy of cancer in two ways. For one, is that if you take a tumor, the majority of the cells in there are actually not inherently malignant in the sense they're not gonna go spin off and create a new tumor. But the subpopulation of cells known as cancer stem cells, which are about one in a thousand within that tumor, can do that. Normally, they're just there providing new cells for the colony and growing slowly, because you know it takes decades for cancer to get to the point where you notice it in surveillance. But so what happens when you use chemo is that you also destroy all of these relatively non-malignant cells in the tumor and you enrich the cancer stem cell population. And in, in, in doing so, you actually have made the cancer more aggressive. Moreover, cancer cells within a tumor can become cancer stem cells. So there's two types. There's the relatively benign daughter cell in the tumor and then there's the cancer stem cell, the mother cell that's at the apex. When you use chemo, you use radiation, both of those things have been shown to potentially convert the benign cell into a stem cell. It's called stemness. It can induce a stemness phenomena. And so that's why chemotherapy is really equivalent to, you know, fighting war with war. I mean, it's, it's, it's fire with fire. It's the same idea. If you talk to veterinarians who practiced medicine 20 years ago, and I know you have, They'll tell you back then uh, they didn't see these kinds of cancer cases or even other things like diabetes as well. There, something has changed dramatically, and we know what it is. We can talk about it. That's causing cancer in pets at really epidemic proportions. And sadly, what people are told about how to deal with that and how to treat it is the same nonsense that we're told for treating ourselves, which is just bombard the body with chemicals, which, as you know, causes more cancer. So. The, the, the vet industry is failing the health of pets in the same way that modern medicine is failing the health of people. When my mother had breast cancer in 96, um, my whole family is medical, you understand. And all of them said, no chemo, no radiation. That's my sister who's a pulmonologist. <laughs> my sisters and sister-in-laws that are nurses. No one wanted her go, to go through that. The problem is that for most cancers, we are no better off. We have lost the war on cancer. If we have to use something that is known to cause cancer, radiation is immunosuppressive and causes cancer, to treat cancer, we failed in the field of healthcare. Period. In 1971, U.S. President Nixon declared a war on cancer, but are we really winning this war in light of the fact that 90% of oncologists won't even take their own treatment? Is the cancer industry any closer today than they were then in finding a cure? Why does this perpetual war on cancer continue? And uh, one of the reasons uh, why this war continues is the money that are being made uh, in this war. And uh, this uh, refers to the treatments, so-called treatments, that are being used in cancer, namely chemotherapy and radiation. Chemotherapy uh, uses the most powerful toxin, toxins known, known to uh, humans. And these toxins, of course, are being sold to us as substances that can uh, kill cancer cells. But uh, these substances also kill, annihilate uh, healthy cells in the body, damage its organs, which make uh, the recovery from cancer almost a uh, miracle, <laughs> impossible. And also this, the very substances that are being used to fight cancer are cancer-causing chemicals. So instead of eliminating cancer or curbing cancer, we are inducing, uh, generating new cancers. People have to understand that the Chemotherapy and, and radiation approach to treating cancers in any, you know, for pets or animals is, is the worst possible thing that you can do based on the evidence itself. This isn't conspiracy theory. This is actually the evidence that is in the literature 
the treatments don't work and they can make the problem far worse. As you probably know, and most people are aware one way or the other, we are not winning this war against cancer. This is a war, one disease we know more than any other disease about, and yet, despite all that knowledge, we're losing the war. The treatments are creating the casualties. There is no question about that. To me, there's no such thing as like fighting cancer. And certainly we need to do research to look at treating different kinds of cancer, but I really think we should be emphasizing earlier. And, and as doctors, we don't do that enough. We're not proactive about that. And this is one of my big concerns right now. We, we're investing tons and tons of money to figure out how to treat disease, how to prolong, prolong and especially in cancer, right? You know, we have the war on cancer and we're all spending, you know, the bazillions of dollars of human and, and financial resources and trying to find uh, better solutions to cancer. But cancer is not a surprise, right? I mean, cancer is a predictable outcome for biological systems. We, we don't need a war on cancer. What we need is actually an education system that, that starts to educate people on how we're connected. In every war, there are casualties. Rather than fight cancer, why not educate everyone about cancer's true causes and treatments, especially in our pets? One area where I believe we all could use some education is learning how to decipher exactly what are the ingredients in pet food. I don't know if you've ever looked at a label, but it can be pretty confusing. They're not smoking cigarettes. They're not drinking. They're not doing some of the things that you and I do that help create an environment that's super available for cancer. They're not stressed out in their minds. You know, they're not doing these things. And so what is it? And to me, what landed for me at that time, still uneducated, still discovering, still researching, was that it had to be something that we are feeding them. So I started to look like on the back of the label to figure out. And then as I started reading the label, I was like, I don't even know what 90% of this is. I have a master's degree in dairy nutrition and I can't read the labels on pet food. The pet food industry uses terms that have no meaning, especially related to our commonly accepted meanings. So natural means nothing in human or animal pet food labeling. Um, chicken meal does not mean what we think it means on the labeling. So we need an unabridged dictionary, this fat, I think, to go through to be able to read the labels, you know, that, that are like a thesaurus where it's like, I think this word means this. And then you look it up and it's like, oh no, this is what the word means in the industry. If you look at their labels, it blows my mind that, um that these foods are used. There is modified starch and, and corn and meat byproducts and rendered fat and whatever else is actually not part of the natural diet of, of um, our canines or felines or other animals. In this next segment, you're about to hear from about a half dozen well-respected veterinarians describing what they learned in veterinary school relating to the approved food for dogs and cats and other pets, commonly referred to as kibble, and whether or not it's a good idea to allow your pet to eat anything but kibble. Uh, when I went to veterinary school, we were taught don't don't put anything in the dog food, right? You feed a complete and balanced dog food designed by, you know, nutritionists and companies and you know, we have good control over what's going into these things and if you add other foods, you mess up the nutritional balance of the food. But you know, we know on this that chronic inflammation is the root of all this chronic disease. And so if we're feeding a food that causes chronic inflammation, we gotta do something about that. Otherwise we're just kind of unethical used car sales we're cashing in on sick dogs. What you're taught in school is never let your clients do a home cooked meal. Do not let them feed anything from the table. Oh my gosh, God forbid. If they feed scraps from the table, they will unbalance the balanced diet that they're pouring with the kibble into the bowl. What a bunch of malarkey. When it comes to nutrition, there's a lot of issues in the pet food industry that we're up against. And um, I believe that how we choose to nourish our animals on a day-to-day -day basis absolutely impacts their immunologic health. So there again, veterinarians will tell you, never switch your pet's food. We are supposed to wean your puppy, let's say at five weeks of age, you put them on an entirely inorganic, overprocessed, dehydrated, nutritionally complete and balanced dead food I want you to think of it like total, we're not picking on total cereal, 
but think of it like total cereal. So you take a regular cereal, you add a synthetic multivitamin to it. Would you feed that to your kid three times a day from the time that they wean till the time that they die? Probably not. But veterinarians have convinced an entire hundred years of pet owners that if you feed anything other than pet food, dry kibble or canned food, you could be harming your pet. In fact, veterinarians are the only wellness profession that actually tell you to eat more processed food and fresh food could be risky. We don't know if it's safe to feed fresh food. Just feed a commercially available processed food to your dog or cat for the rest of their lives. Because in veterinary school, we don't necessarily, we're not taught that nutrition matters. You know, we're taught a list of prescription diets if you're, once your animals get sick, and that really mo the majority of animals in the U.S. go to the veterinarian and their veterinarian doesn't ask detailed nutrition questions because nutrition is separate from disease, which you and I know isn't true, but that's where we're at in veterinary medicine. It seems like animals are the only being on the planet that we're told you should feed them the same thing every meal for the rest of their life. What a fallacy. You know, and I, I can only think that that got started from the big pet food companies who said, well, we're going to teach the veterinarians who are then going to teach their their clients, you know, for the patients. And then, you know, our, all of our commercials on TV, you must feed them this 100% complete and balanced diet in their bowl every single day. And so I actually got a box of cereal and we made a new cover for it. And we put on the front, you know, human kibble. And it says on there, 100% complete and nutritionally balanced. And then it's got, you know, it's vitamin list on the back and all the ingredients. And I say to people all the time, okay, here's your human kibble. I'm going to pour this in your bowl twice a day. You don't get milk. You don't get, you know, nothing on it. I'm going to pour this dry cereal in your bowl. This is what you get to eat twice a day, every day for the rest of your life. Forever. How are we feeling? Feeling good about that? I'm thinking you're going to have some big deficiencies because adding a synthetic chemical vitamin mineral mix is not the same as getting whole food nutrition from real plants, real meat. It's not feeding a species appropriate diet. Our dogs are, and cats are not out there foraging for synthetic chemicals. They're, you know, my cats go outside, you know, they bring me back bunnies and mice and moles and, you know, they're getting a species appropriate diet. And they're pretty dang healthy. All the vet students got a discount on pet food um, and that that really was our, our exposure to nutrition. Years ago, I didn't know any better, when, you know, 33 years ago when we went to veterinary school, we were given alphabet soup kibble. You know, he's got a kidney problem, he's getting an alphabet soup for that. And if he's got a heart problem, he's getting, you know, the one labeled for that. And for years, that's what we did. And that's what we sold. And that's what we pushed because I didn't know any better. And once I knew better, then now I can do better. Um, but. You know, I feel bad for all those pets when I didn't know better. Yeah. Were you were you taught any of this in vet school about the kibble? Not one iota. Yeah. One of the important things to remember in any investigation is to follow the money trail. And if you dig long enough, you'll find out that many expert recommendations are actually nothing more than paid endorsements. And much of the independent research is not actually all that independent at all. Are you enjoying this first episode thus far? Are you learning a lot of great information? Are you excited to watch the rest of this show and the next six episodes? Do you think that others would enjoy watching it as well? Do you want to support our mission to educate the world on the truth about pet cancer for free? Then please help us spread the word by sharing this page on Facebook, Twitter, and other social media sites by clicking the links below. Your support will make a huge difference in how many people we reach and ultimately how many pet lives are saved. Thanks in advance, and please click the links below to help us spread the word. Now, back to episode one of The Truth About Pet Cancer. Because of the research dollars that drive people's ability to do research, to publish, to speak, to have positions, to have workers in their labs, I think that we are being misguided in this country because the research isn't done independently anymore. You know, way back it used to be that you'd have your universities do research and it, it, was, it was independent. Now it's paid. There's no independence now. The cancer industry is based on the pharmaceutical model 
where we have to treat cancer and we're only allowed to treat cancer with the current standard of care, which is basically chemotherapy, radiotherapy and those targeted therapies, none of which work. So we maintain this disease and it's very important too that for the cancer model to work that we maintain the Western diet, which is producing the cancer. So again, we have a perfect model for the pharmaco pharmacology or pharmaceutical companies or big pharma, as some people call it. We have a, a, a Western program of nutrition that promotes the disease in dogs, cats and humans. And we have a, a pharmacological treatment that neither cures the disease nor, nor prevents it, but it's the one that is allowed by law to be used. That's what a model. So, and we're feeding all these cancer patients into this program and it's producing millions of dollars. In, in fact, in some countries, the pharmaceutical company by its taxes supports the, 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 the government. So, wow, we, 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 are, we are in all sorts of trouble until we can overcome this enormous model. There is no doubt that current medicine is based upon the pharmaceutical model. I don't think anyone would dispute that. But what are the ramifications? Have you ever heard the term iatrogenic? This basically means caused by medicine or by a doctor. How frequent are iatrogenic deaths? I think the answer will shock you. Medicine in the United States is the third leading cause of death in the United States. And that's, that is just you know, in medical, not just medical mistakes, it's drugs, iatrogenic yeah. damage. That doesn't even include over-the-counters, the things that, that people die from over-the-counter. You know, it is sad to know that uh, doctors, the healers, are the third leading cause of death in the United States. It's like we worry about sharks, we worry about flying on planes, while ironically, and this is hard to say because I'm a doctor, doctors are more dangerous, in quotes, than any of these causes. And I think that, once again, I do not think that obviously we don't intend to harm, but I think that we've been taught system that doesn't work, and that's a serious problem. That is a serious problem. I have a question for you. Why do some, mostly all veterinarians, promote the practice of feeding a commercial kibble diet, including prescription diets, to your pets. Let me ask you another question. Did you know that many of the pet food companies spend upwards of six figures being platinum sponsors at veterinary conventions? They donate big dollars to veterinary member associations and they donate millions of dollars each year to veterinary schools worldwide, especially the 30 vet schools here in the USA? And did you know that, as unbelievable as it might sound, it's not uncommon for employees of pet food companies to actually teach veterinary students about pet nutrition? Where I went to school, um, there was a lot of funding provided by, by pet food companies. Um, now, I'm not suggesting that necessarily, uh, you know, the education that I got nutrition-wise was, was definitively sort of um, um, you know, steered by that by that funding, but I think it's a I, I think it's a real good illustration of just how the Western medical field tends to look at nutrition anyway. Uh, you know, so as a, just as a for example, um, you know, as a veterinary student, everybody in my class and every student in the veterinary school got a free bag of dog food from from two different pet food companies every month. They did a really really excellent job at buying brand loyalty at a very early age. And, and, and what the practical result of that is, is that most veterinarians, uh, you know, they take a very oversimplified approach to, to nutrition. As vet students, we were all given free food from Science Diet from Hills. That was part of the program. So our nutrition exposure was pretty limited to like critical care nutrition, like in your, you know, medicine rounds for the really sick animals and trying to, to figure out how to feed them with the feeding tubes, that kind of thing. Um, and then the, the cattle rations and then the food that we were getting from Hills for our own animals. Um, and there wasn't much of anything about real nutrition. And you never really questioned it because yeah, it's a science diet is supposed to be better than the stuff you get at the grocery store, right? And so, you know, that's what we'd sell. And there's a prescription diet for every problem and it comes in a bag and it's easy and you don't have to think about it. And I think that vet schools 
do their best within the frame what um, what the professors and teachers know. I think that what happened uh, is that we are too, or the veterinary colleges are way too connected with drug companies and pet food companies in a way that they sponsor and finance the research that is done in, in universities. So I think that that's where uh, the biggest disconnect and the biggest problem lies. Uh, obviously pet food companies are, are smart corporations. They know that when they start educating uh, the veterinary students early in vet schools uh, that, that that's the best chance to actually get them promote and use their product. So they basically have captured the, the education kind of curriculum in veterinary schools. I was at a meeting two weekends ago um, at a vet school and was kind of appalled um, to see in the hallway all the different big pharmaceutical companies and the big food companies, you know, had big bulletin boards filled with advertising to promote their products. So these kids in school are being just the simple exposure that if Eli Lilly Elanco, you know, is promoting this and offering these deals and you know, man, that's really good. That must mean that Elanco, you know, is top notch because look what they're doing for us. So my question is this, you know, you're a trained veterinarian. You said you learned some information in your undergraduate on nutrition, but when you're in vet school, what do they teach you about what animals should be eating? Well, in vet school, they didn't really teach nutrition. You know, although they say vets learn nutrition better than medical doctors, which is really frightening considering how poor I think the quality of nutritional education was in veterinary medicine. What they teach in veterinary medicine is dietics. They teach you what diet to use for what condition. So, and the diets are commercially prepared and the people that are teaching you what diets to use are the same people that are profiting from the sale of these diets. The veterinary colleges, I mean, they, they need financial support, I get it. AVMA needs financial support, AHA needs financial support, I get it. They get a lot of that financial support from the big four or five pet food companies. A ton of financial support. Is that a conflict of interest? I believe it is. For instance, um, there is a training group in the state of New Jersey that trains seeing eye dogs for the blind. They are heavily supported by one of the big pet food companies. And so any of those puppies that are in training in a family setting or after they are adopted and given to the blind person must main, be maintained on that food for life. Wow. They are not allowed to change. And so I get these seeing eye puppies that families are taking care of and you know they're raising them until they're ready to be adopted. And you know they bring them in and they're suffering with just horrendous allergies, inflammation, inflammatory bowel disease, things that I know are being caused by their food, and yet I'm not allowed to change the diet away from that company's food. And I can't make them better with that. Mm. And, you know, if I had the opportunity to say, well, we're not going to use something processed. Let's use a whole food diet. Let's, let's choose the foods that are going to be the right ones for your dog's digestion and your dog's system. We could, we could make those dogs so happy. And instead they, you know, they get to suffer a life of chronic inflammation and allergy. When I was in veterinary school, I was excited. I had no money. I borrowed, I had scholarships, I worked part time and, you know, like I did everything I could to survive. And I was elated that they were giving me free dog food. Okay. And our nutrition course back then at Cornell, the nutritionist said, you are so busy with all your other courses. Here's all this information from different food companies and just study that and you'll be fine. And so, yes, it just, it didn't quite feel right, but also you were excited that you got free food when you were trying to make it, you know, get through vet school. When I first got out of vet school, that's what I was feeding with those. And I thought I was doing a good job. You know, we're programmed, you know, you can't really blame veterinarians, we're programmed that that's okay. It wasn't until uh, my cat started developing liver disease that I started questioning, what am I feeding them? Does your vet recommend kibble? If so, did they tell you that in 2014, three of the biggest pet food manufacturers were found to have aflatoxins in their pet food? Now, aflatoxins are known to be carcinogens. 
Did they tell you in 2015, one of the largest pet food manufacturers was found to have mycotoxins, which are fungal toxins in their food, as well as different bacteria that the FDA determined to be qualifying pathogens and that they posed a serious threat to public health? I'm guessing they didn't tell you about that. What are we feeding our pets? The sad thing is that pet parents just do not know. And um, our dog was um, a yellow lab and she was um, a hunting dog and in her prime, but we didn't know any better. We just bought the biggest bag of cheapest dog food that you could. And what was her dog's name? Molly. 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 I, I brought some pictures of her. She was just precious. And you know, she ate that every day and she loved to eat it. She loved to eat it so much that she, we actually had to add water to her kibble because she just ate it so fast, but it irritated her throat. And I really feel like that's one of the things that started opening her up. And that's one of the areas that she had cancer. She had cancer both in her throat and esophagus with masses and then also in her elbows. Mm. So it was, it was pretty bad. And so, so what, ended, what ended up happening with Molly? Well, um, she, she heart started having a hard time um, and she was the one who would, who would race the fastest and, and, get, the, and get this or that you know, practice um, during um, hunting season first. And uh, all of a sudden she started favoring one of her legs and uh, we had it tested and they had found cancer. So um, they actually, uh, they had to remove her in entire arm. And it was so hard and it's, it's amazing because, um, you know, dogs and humans both, I mean, they, they recover like when they lose limbs and things like that. So it was, it was hard to watch. Um, and she, she really started regaining everything and then literally um, they had a test done and they had found out it had already gone into her bones. Mm -hmm. And literally within eight weeks, um, we, had, we went back in we, and she just did something wasn't right. And they had showed um, uh, an x-ray from August and this was January and the mass on her throat, you know, after she had had the leg already removed, it had um, just exploded. It was, it was huge. She was hardly being able to swallow and um, everything was a strain. And so the next day we actually had to put her down. Mm -hmm. So it was really hard. It was the hardest thing I had to ever watch, um, you know, really holding her in, in my arms, watching her um, pass it was, was, was horrible. What, uh, if anything, did you do to treat it during that time? Well, I wish we would have known what, what we know now, um, but you know, her diet was definitely a huge, huge factor. And um, she was so smart. We, um, she used to, whenever it was somebody's birthday, we would call someone up and we would have her bark happy birthday. And, um, and so my mom used to give her bread. And um, so she would put out the bread and the dog would bark. Well, it, she knew that that song meant that she got bread. Well, as she got older and older, she ate more and more white bread. And my, my mom actually made her white bread every day um, while, while she was, you know, a grown dog. And, you know, like all of us, you know, when you're a pet owner, at first you follow all the rules and you do all the things you do. And then things start getting a little bit more lax and a little bit more lax. And really towards the end, she was eating a ton of white bread and and just regular kibble and you know so there was nothing that that we did you know other than what any other pet owner you know would have done at that point and was that was just making her comfortable try to keep her comfortable mm -hmm. that's a sad story but why are we failing when it comes to treating cancer with conventional treatments like chemo and radiation why are we making such little progress could it be due to a misunderstanding of exactly what cancer is I think that's the reason why we're not making any major advances in the field, because they're treating cancer as if it were a genetic disease. Toxic chemo, what are they doing with toxic chemo? We're breaking the cell cycle of the proliferating tumor cell, because we know there are mutations that affect the cell cycle. So we're using toxic drugs to break the cell cycle. Well, that's true, you can kill cancer cells that way, but you also kill every other normal cell that's also dividing, like the ones that make hair, you go bald, you know, you have problems with your digestive tract. You have problems with any kind of normal proliferating cell using a, a global strategy to radiation will kill dividing cells because it creates oxygen radicals that cause these tumor cells to break apart and, and you die, but you also harm the normal cells. And then with traditional veterinary medicine, what do we do? Instead of strengthening the immune system, we suppress it. We give them steroids. We give them, you know, cyclosporin. We give them Apoquil. We give them all these drugs that are going to shut down the immune system, but yet they've got all this chronic inflammation. Now what's the immune system supposed to do? Cancer wants to come on board? 
No problem. The immune system has no way to fight back. And if we have a disease where our treatments are failing, we usually ask the question in medicine, do we genuinely understand what we're dealing with? I mean, with metastatic cancer, if somebody gets metastatic cancer or a dog or cat gets metastatic cancer, that is a virtual death sentence. And we, we don't have the power to beat this disease currently using the current standard of care. So I have to ask the question, do we understand what this disease is? Do we understand the science about how to treat cancer or is it dogma? Let's learn more about what drives modern cancer research. Driven by a dogma. The dogma is that cancer is a genetic disease that must be treated along these lines. So there's a dogmatic view of what, of, of what this disease actually is. And once that dogma starts to fragment, uh, you're going to start to see an opening of these alternative uh, approaches that are non-toxic, that are ultimately going to be more successful than, than what's been done uh, currently. You know, and we have evidence to support this. It's hard to get funding for this work. You know, it's, oh, what do you mean? You, well, you go, the NIH isn't interested. The NIH thinks cancer is a genetic disease. Everybody on the review panel thinks cancer is a genetic disease. If it's met metabol, if, it, if they say, oh, your metabolism is very important in cancer, but the genes are causing the abnormal metabolism. No, no, it's the abnormal metabolism causing the, the genes. The genes are in effect. They're not the cause of this whole thing. Oh, my God, you're telling me my whole worldview is upside down. And the answer is yes, it is. It's upside down. And look at the 1,600 dead people a day in the United States. That's the result of your upside down view of the disease. It's not a genetic disease in the sense that it's primarily caused by mutations. The mutations are a downstream event that occur afterwards. And we have looked at it as groups of scientists and we're now looking at all those mutations and regarding them as the prime cause and then trying to attack cancer by looking at the mutations and the protein products that those mutations cause. But that's not the primary cause. That they, they only occur because DNA repair processes were turned off by the mitochondria signaling to, to, to genes like retinoblastoma and P53 and, and, and also the genes that are involved in cell reproduction, the so-called oncogenes. They, this is then the downstream events that cause those mutations. And we've looked, looked at these, caused these um, effects of cancer and regarded them as the cause and tried to attack by those effects. Look at the board of Susan Coleman breast cancer. Every one of the people, the scientists on the board of Susan Coleman, thinks that cancer is a genetic disease. How do we know? Because we look at their publications. They look at the gene mutations. Irrelevant. <laughs> it's irrelevant. It's, it doesn't make any sense. Consequently, more people get cancer and more people die. It's all in the textbooks. It's on the website of the National Cancer Institute. Cancer is a genetic disease. I've got 20 books here. Cancer is a genetic disease. Um, so we indoctrinate physicians and scientists to read these textbooks and then go out and start studying all these mutations. We have the Broad Institute down here, $100 million institute studying mutations in cancer. It's irrelevant. It doesn't mean anything. Hard to say. It's, it, it's terrible to say that in such a few words that most of that is, is nonsense. Um, the, the, it's not going to work because it's not a genetic disease. They screen millions of cancer mutations. And there's so many, it becomes mind-boggling to even comprehend how many no, uh, defects they found in cancer cells. So to help out, they bring in the IBM computer called Watson. You know, he can win Jeopardy, he's the best chess player in the world. He can store massive amounts of data. So they bring that instrument down there to try to help people comprehend all the mutations. The problem is, no one told Watson that cancer is not a genetic disease, that it's a metabolic disease. The machine is a mindless instrument. It doesn't have the functional brain cells to know garbage in, garbage out, right? <laughs> so, it's, 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 so consequently, uh, the poor machine, right, is not that smart. Pet cancer is a big issue, and certainly um, both with dogs and cats, we know that it's actually, I would say, epidemic at this point. And it wasn't always the case. Um, we know that cancer in dogs and cats both has a genetic component and also an environmental component. But it's interesting, 
The genetic component is actually, um, in my experience, for the last 20 years of being in private practice, is actually less than 10%. Certainly it's there. And the reason that the genetics are there is, in my opinion, is that we have really overbred, we've misbred and overbred some of our most popular breeds. That has resulted in the last 200 years breeding father to daughter and mother to son or brother sister breeding which ironically the AKC kind of condones and endorses and that's a problem the fact that we will paper pedigree dogs that are inbred they call it line breeding because it doesn't sound good to call it um, incest okay. but the truth is when we breed that closely a lot of that DNA that's expressed isn't healthy and is vulnerable weak it's not it's not desirable DNA when we breed for uh, phenotype when we breed for aesthetics versus genetic resilience that's also a problem so humans have gotten in there muck things up because we're breeding um, animals to be bigger stronger a rottweiler people are interested in, in a 75 pound rottweiler they now want a 130 pound rotty people don't want a 10 pound yorkie they want a three pound yorkie and in my practice i have two two pound yorkies which are the size of guinea pigs so when we breed animals to be supersized or really tiny that also allows of course it's a novelty but that doesn't necessarily help animals express their best dna we're also breeding for um, certain looks instead of great genetic resilience and that's a big problem but frustratingly we also have the veterinary issue and that's heartbreaking for me because i am a veterinarian but conventional veterinarians, it's not that they're in any way trying to perpetuate this cancer issue. They're very alarmed just as I am. The frustration is we're not taught in vet school how to identify lifestyle obstacles that we need to be helping clients remove in order to prevent cancer from occurring. We're not taught that. Okay. Veterinary schools in North America are reactive, which means we go to school and we learn how to identify symptoms of a disease and then what drugs to use to treat the symptoms, but we're not instructed or taught or mentored how to actually prevent disease from occurring. So we have a reactive veterinary model instead of a proactive veterinary model. So we're waiting until these animals get cancer and then we have to talk about cutting it out, poisoning it out with chemotherapy or burning it out with radiation. And that's, those are the only options when we get to the point that we've been reactive. Again, we see that the veterinary education system is broken. I want to make it clear that this documentary is not intended to be anti-vet and also that many of the veterinarians that I interviewed are not opposed to Western medicine. An integrative approach to health and wellness is what most vets are aiming for. Just like you and me, they just want pets to be healthy. I'm very grateful for it because I think it's necessary to have that foundation um, in medicine and, and primarily in you know, what, what we learn is pathology, I mean, what's normal, and then what's abnormal, um, and then, you know, the diseases, and then the drugs or the surgery to help manage those diseases. I don't think there's time, <laughs> for one thing, um, or any kind of emphasis on what it means to truly be healthy, um, what it means for an animal to be vitally healthy. Um, and thriving. Um, there's a whole lot that goes into being healthy that is different than just preventing a disease or managing symptoms. To be clear, I had a very good veterinary education. I, I mean, I have no complaints about it, but, but you know, veterinary schools teach, teach veterinarians within the scope of, of, I guess, what we will call conventional Western medicine. So, uh, you know, conventional pharmacology, conventional surgery, um, these sorts of things. And, 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 you know, all of those treatments absolutely have their benefit. Uh, you know, I, to this day, still practice Western medicine. I'm a really big fan. Uh, but what I came to learn over years of being a veterinarian is there are things that Western medicine can't address and can't fix. And what I learned from my, from my studies as I began to learn things like Chinese medicine, acupuncture, herbal therapy, chiropractic, and, and just on and on, what I learned were, was is there, there are actually many of these problems that Western medicine has a really hard time with. Um, complementary and alternative care actually works very well for. In fact, it's fascinating that there seems to be this almost sort of cosmic dovetail between the two in the sense that where Western medicine tends to have problems is, is also where complementary medicine tends to do really well 
and vice versa. So it's just, it's, it's really just a match made in heaven. I learned more about the whole digestive process because it's not just about the food that the animals eat, it's how their bodies are able to or not able to process them. And we hear so much these days about the microbiome, this, this huge um, um, organism that really lives in us of microorganisms that we share the same environment and we share the same food and we share the same health. And so a healthy microbiome creates you know, creates health in, in the animal. And so the diet and the digestion and the herbs were all very powerful tools that I learned to use and to interface, blend with the conventional therapies that I'd learned. And I, I knew even then that you can't practice alternative medicine unless you can practice good conventional medicine first. If you think about it, nature's integrated. You know, like people separate things, you know, the word analysis, anal, lysis, right? <laughs> yeah, sadly. Wow. But ana actually means to break apart, right? So ana, lysis, means to break it apart, to look at the pieces and figure out how it fits together. And nature doesn't break it apart to learn. Nature actually puts it together in pieces, and the pieces all have a place. And my attitude is no one form medicine has all the answers. What you do is you look at the benefits, the risks, and you weigh them. Okay, and then you say, what is best for my animal? There are times where I think Western medicine is fabulous, and I wouldn't give it up for anything. My practice is an integrated practice, which means I get to play in both sandboxes. But what is really, really special for me is that I never, ever, ever look a client in the eye and say, there's nothing more I can do for you. Mm. There's always something I can do, even if it's quality of life. If that's all it is, that's huge but we never run out of something to do, like what was told to me with my horse. I'm sorry, there's nothing more you can do. That's not an answer. <laughs> well, That's not acceptable. I agree with Dr. Marlene. There's nothing more that we can do for your pet is not an acceptable answer. There is always hope. We have so many viable options available in nature's medicine chest, from Chinese medicine to herbal therapy to chiropractic, and the list goes on and on and on. The reality is that our choice of how to keep our pets healthy and or how to treat their disease should not be based upon whether it's alternative or conventional, but the criteria should be what is best for my pet. You let go of saying what this is conventional or this is alternative or this is natural and you just say, what helps? What is the best thing for the animal? And you do whatever combination. Looking at cancer is like looking into a garden. You know, we're looking through different windows. And so we're not, you know, this, this, is the, this is the oxygen deprivation theory, this is trophoblast. We're looking at pieces of the puzzle and we, have, we need to put all of those pieces together and start looking at it as a kind of an integrated whole, the holistic approach to things. I'm really big right now about talking about um, veterinarians and, and animal um, guardians becoming more gardeners and less warriors. We have to fight disease. If you grow a nice garden, everything grows. And if you're actually an organic gardener, you know that strategy, right? So you, the richer your soil is, the more resistant it is to disease. And, uh, and the body's the same way. So if we're just feeding processed carbohydrates and processed rancid fats and you know a lot of these things that are part of the standard American human diet, then we're gonna get a series of outcomes, which is the standard American <laughs> outcome, which is diabetes, stroke, heart disease, cancer. But we know we can take those patients and change the way they eat, and we can see um, differences in their health. So why can't we do the same thing with animals? The current status quo treatments for cancer are horrendous. Just chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, they do not stop cancer, and they do not give people the other options that work better, that are safer, that are more affordable, and that actually eliminate cancer for life. I think the key thing is to educate yourself. You know, we're doing the truth about cancer. Because once you know that, and then you receive, okay, here's a diagnosis, you've got cancer. It's not, it's not about fear and going into that place, and then you, know, you have to do this, and we've got to start immediately, all that sort of thing. We know, we know so much more. So that's a historic uh, way of addressing it. And now, for example, when, uh, when the lady had a recent uh, recurrence, we got all these notes, oh, I'm so devastated with the news, oh, this is awful. You must be, you know, really going through so much anguish. And we said, it's just, it's just a little, you know, stage four metastatic breast cancer, you know. 
And uh, so we had a plan and we you know, executed the plan. She interrupted her tour. And then uh, in three months, kicked back in. She just finished 18 concerts and going strong. <laughs> you know? That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So and I think a lot, so of it is, a lot of it is your positive mindset and believing yeah. that you can beat it. And I know that it's a very frightening thing, you know, because I've been through it a few times, so I understand. But, you know, having John in my life, of course, I'm really fortunate because I have all this uh, knowledge um, at my fingertips. Mm -hmm. Olivia Newton-John just summarized the vital message that I want you to remember. Cancer is not a death sentence and fear has no place in the equation. Education is the key. Knowledge is power. I hope you learned a lot from episode one and I hope that you're encouraged and empowered. Be sure to tune back in for episode two where we'll explore the pet food industry in great detail and you'll learn from some insiders including how pet food is made, processed and produced and exactly where those ingredients come from. Together, we'll examine the science of epigenetics and nutrigenomics. We'll scrutinize species-appropriate diets, the ketogenic diet, and we'll dive into the facts about kibble. I hope to see you there. Join the movement, support the mission, save lives. We're a small company that's committed to the truth and to helping save pets. When you support our mission by owning the complete series today, you allow us to continue to research, interview, expose and share this knowledge with the world absolutely free just like we're doing right now. If you've learned something, you've been inspired, you want to help save pets across the globe or you just love how it feels to support a good cause, please consider owning The Truth About Pet Cancer today. As always, a portion of each sale gets donated to charities that are doing real research and are focused on protecting our pets and keeping them cancer free. Simply click the banner below to join the movement and support our mission. Thanks in advance. Hi, this is John and Olivia. And Hi, Olivia. He's John. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be clear. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we'd love for you to watch the truth about pet cancer. Yeah, we can hopefully give you some great tips to keep your pets healthy and learn something about yourselves too.